Last week we read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5, which states, I want you to listen to this even as you're turning, watch carefully. The Bible says, you know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask. That's out of the New International Version of the Bible. Again, we never used flattery in this ministry, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. When God's Word speaks, that is a witness from God already Himself. So, again, we're talking about taking off the mask and what it represents. In that entire chapter, Paul the Apostle describes his ministry of preaching and teaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and doing so with pure motives. That's one of the things that blessed my life. As long as we do it with pure motives, no matter what the enemy tries to do in destroying or causing distress in the lives of people, our pure motives is great encouragement for us. So Paul the Apostle began that second chapter, 1 Thessalonians, and actually the first verse of Scripture by telling the church, that his ministry was not a failure in any way even though at times it looks like they were going to be defeated it looked like he and his ministry were going to be over with but it was not a failure but it was a success in the eyes of God Paul's way of ministering set the standard for the body of Christ for the church for preachers and teachers and people in the body of Christ as long as we're willing to receive that set standard that the Spirit of God used Paul with and we know that there are four things that we're going to remember. He ministered in spite of the strong opposition that was out there. When I say strong opposition, you know what that means. We focused on that. That includes the severe suffering, the insults, the beatings. He said, I minister with pure motives in spite of the abandonment, uh, being abandoned by those that are closest to him. He ministered without error or deception. He ministered without flattery, as it's been mentioned. And he also ministered like a gentle mother and father father bringing their children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. When he spoke the words, we did not put on a mask. He wasn't speaking about a physical, tangible uh, mask, but he was talking about the symbology of the mask, which would include pretense and hypocrisy. In the year of 1956, Paramount Pictures came up with a wonderful comedy starring Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, and the movie was entitled Partners. Not partners with a T, but partners with a D. And it's definitely one of the funniest movies that I've ever seen. And Jerry Lewis is one of the greatest, funniest comedians that I've ever had the pleasure of seeing. Nevertheless, this movie is the story of a rich mama's boy, even though he was grown up, by the name of Wade Kingsley Jr., played by Jerry Lewis. And he travels from New York City to the Old West with his friend Slim Mosley Jr., played by Dean Martin. And so when Wade and Slim were babies some years earlier, their dads were partners at a place called the Kingsley Ranch. Uh, but their dads were murdered by a gang of bad guys, a band of bad guys called the Masked Raiders. Everybody say the Masked Raiders. This second part of our series entitled Take Off the Mask is entitled Exposing the Masked Raiders. So... Uh, the bad guys were there with an attempt to steal the Kingsley Ranch. In other words, they were trying desperately very much to steal what did not belong to them, and they would not quit. So both Wade Jr. and Slim Jr., remember the words Jr., the sons, they traveled out west to stop this gang of bad guys from gaining control of the family ranch. They were there to stop this band of bad guys called uh, the Master Raiders, from stealing what wasn't there, and they would not give up. All along the way, they were singing the song like, uh, uh, You and me, we're going to be partners. That's Dean Martin. And then Jerry Lewis had this real raspy voice, and he would sing something. And my, children, my grandchildren know this. You and me. Did that sound like uh, Jerry Lewis? We're going to be pals. So they would sing songs like that, talking about being partners, going out to the Old West. But here's what's interesting about this, is that the leader of the masked raiders, when uh, Wade and Slim were older now, was a man by the name of Dan Hollis, and he was the son of a bad guy by the name of Sam Hollis, who killed their dads many years prior in their attempts to steal the Kingsley Ranch. It's kind of like the principle even in a comedy of generations from one generation to another where the enemy just won't quit. The Bible mentions a lot about the sins of the fathers as well as the inheritance, the glorious inheritance of godly fathers as well. The sins of the fathers but also the inheritance of godly fathers. 
I don't know about you, but I want to receive godly inheritance from godly fathers. I'm not talking about biological fathers, but godly fathers. But really, uh, even after many years, the devil, as represented by the masked raiders, and you would see Jerry Lewis so full of fear at the time, at least until the end of the movie, he said, the masked raiders. I think I'm doing a pretty good job at uh, uh, imitating him. But uh, you see, these masked raiders didn't stop with the dads. They continued on or at least tried to continue in stealing what wasn't theirs even when the babies had grown up to be full-grown men. Did you know that that's what's happening today? The very word raiders is mentioned seven times in the New International Version of the Bible. We're not talking about a football team, but about gangs of bad guys who were out to steal and who are out to steal what's not theirs, but they did so with an attempt to gain things for themselves. Well, at times the raiders in the Bible referred to, uh, uh, they were referred to as the bands of raiders. And we're not talking about a musical group, but we're talking about well-organized enemy forces that do not give up easily. You and I need to be aware of these things since we're talking about the masked raiders. But they were not going to take this lying down. What they wanted, they were going to get, which is a symbol of greed as well. The masked raiders. Genesis 49, 19 is one of those areas of Scripture that speaks explicitly about the band of raiders. Everybody say, the band of raiders. You see, gang activity didn't just start here in Pueblo, Colorado in Bessemer. Yeah. Or the east side. Or the west side. Or Belmont. <laughs> Sounds funny, huh? It didn't start with our generation or our previous generation. It had been going on for a long, long time, even in Old Testament times. In fact, 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 20 to 21, and we'll read in a moment's time, but that's another place in Scripture exposing certain masked raiders. In this case, the raiders happen to be the Moabite raiders, one of the persistent, ruthless enemies that were, that were out to destroy the nation of Israel. There were times when they got the advantage of them and then there were times when Israel repented of their sins that the raiders were defeated. Another group of the band of raiders were the Ammonite raiders, also spoken of in the Bible. But I want to read something in 2 Kings chapter 13. I hope that you're going to follow along with this. Again, this is the second part of a message we're entitling, Take Off the Mask. And this one is about exposing the, the, the mask raiders of, uh, of, of what the Bible speaks about. So here it is, 2 Kings 13 and verse 20. Elisha, who was a man of God, he died and was buried. Now Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. They were, again, very well organized. Uh, now notice in the following verse the fear that they put upon people in Israel. Which There's the message, do not fear, do not be afraid. Verse 21 says, once while some Israelites were bearing a man... Suddenly they saw a band of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. Now remember, Elisha had already died some time prior. So they threw the body into a, Elisha's tomb, and when the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Now, this is a good place for us to say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your name. Oh, God, there's only one name, and he is the name of Jesus Christ. The very name Jesus means salvation. He is Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord who saves the Lord, who is the creator of the entire universe. But you know, the purpose of this given miracle, not only before the Israelites, but the band of raiders, the purpose of this miracle was to confirm that God is not a God of the dead, but He's a God of the living. And if you're alive, He can be your God right now. But there's a second reason for this miracle, is to let them know, to remind them that they never need to be afraid, they never need to fear, as long as they kept their focus on Him and on Him alone, and not the masked raiders. I believe that God is speaking to our hearts here today, no doubt. Undeniably, inescapably, He is speaking to our hearts. But perhaps one of the most recognizable episodes of the band of raiders is the one found in Judges chapter 2, verses 11 to 16. You can just write the reference down. You've got to remember this. And this was at a time, and this is hard to say, but this was at a time when the nation of Israel was not in the will of God. When Israel was doing their own thing, when Israel refused to repent of their sins and be Delivered. There's that word, delivered. It's a biblical word. Uh, this was at a time when Israel took their focus off of the one true God who had provided for them for so many years. 
in so many ways. They took their eyes off of God. So here in Judges chapter 2, verses 11 to 16, God had no alternative but to allow the Moabite raiders, the masked raiders, to confuse them and to send them into a, a spiral, a downward spiral life of distress. I want you to remember that word, distress. The word distress comes from a Hebrew word, yatsar, which means to be oppressed or vexed. To be oppressed or vexed. The word vex, as in vexation or to be vexed, is a word as in an attack from the enemy in the spirits of darkness. But it also means to be in misery or anguish. Nobody likes to be in misery, but there were times when God found no alternative but to allow this to happen with the hopes that they would repent, be saved, and live a glorious life. Look at this, Judges chapter 2 and verse 11. Somebody say Judges 2, verse 11. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals, one of the false gods of that time that the Canaanites were in the midst of. By the way, hey, let me have your attention. God had already warned them when you go into this land, the promised land, Canaan, Canaan land, He said, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the people there. Don't do it. But they did it. They didn't at first, but they did it. Now watch. The Baal, Baal or the Baals were not the only false gods of that day. Look at verse 12. They forsook the Lord the God of their fathers. Whew, there's the glorious inheritance if they would have chosen it. But they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped the various gods of the people around them. They provoked the Lord to what? To anger. An all-loving God. I meet people all the time, brother who will say, I can't believe that God would be a God that punishes people or sends people to hell. Well, in all reality, to begin with, God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves by rejecting Jesus Christ and God's plan of salvation. He is a loving God. I know there's a lot of questions we have that, that we may not have the answers to in, in human terms, but He's still a good God. So they provoke the Lord to anger. Now verse 13, because they forsook Him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. The word Ashtoreth, is a term related not only to a false god, but the fertility gods of that day, which involved sexuality, immorality, orgies, every kind of evil imagination sexually that one can imagine. That's what the Ashtoreths were there. In fact, that was the first time that you see in the Bible the mention of poles, as in the Ashtra poles. And sometimes, you know, you may even be watching a commercial and you'll see somebody dancing around a pole. That's where it began in Old Testament times when they first took the one true God. It's not exercise. It's something that the devil himself has concocted. Verse 14, in his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to, what's that word? Raiders who plundered them, meaning took all their stuff. The Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Verse 15, whenever Israel went out to fight here it is, the hand of the Lord. Say that together with me. The hand of the Lord. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. Just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress. Verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Let me have your attention. The judges at that time were not like the judges we have today. They were not kings, but they were called out by God to provide leadership for the people of Israel. Before the time of kings, before Saul and David and some of the other great kings of the Old Testament and some wicked kings too. But they were judges. Samuel was one of them. Deborah was another one. One of the great women of God that God used to, to lead Israel and to be a protector over the nation of Israel. But they were called by God to deliver Israel when they were in trouble as long as they would repent of their sins. That's all that God was asking them to do. Nevertheless, this is just one of the instances where God allowed the master raiders, this band of raiders, to bring, to bring Israel to a place of distress in order that they may be saved. And I love this about God. He's straight to the point, cut to the chase. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty about this thing. But what about the masked raiders in the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11? Well, before we read, before we read three consecutive verses of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to ask you to get involved in this with me. I'd like to ask you in advance to notice how many times, notice how many times the words masquerade or masquerades or masquerading 
is found in just three verses of Scripture. I'm also going to ask you to think of why this terminology is mentioned so many times and why it's mentioned so close together. The very word masquerading comes from a Greek word which means to disguise, you know that, to transform, and a lot of people don't know that, but the word masquerade means to transform. In fact, the third definition of the word masquerading means to change from one form to another. That's a heavy word too, isn't it? There are three types of people who are seen as Satan's masquerading raiders, bent on deceiving, destroying, and bringing about distress in the lives of people. These are the masked raiders of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I asked you to think about who they were. Here they are in order. False apostles, deceitful workmen, servants of Satan. Let's read that again, or let me mention it again. False apostles, deceitful workmen, and that includes male and female. And it also involves servants of Satan. I didn't make this up. You'll find this, verse 13 to begin with, 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 13, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Verse 15, it is not surprising then if his servants, there's the servants of Satan, it is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. So, ladies and gentlemen, when Paul the Apostle was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words down for the ages, including for you and I, he did so primarily to expose the false teachers of that day, not only of those in that day, but for the rest of time. I thank God for that so that you and I could be alert to this. He spoke of false teachers and their ability to deceive the church when allowed to do so. In other words, he, uh, the devil himself enabled these masquerading maskers, if you will, please, to deceive as long as people were caught off guard. We're not playing games, are we? So uh, whenever people allowed them to masquerade, they took advantage of the people. Their goal was to cause distress and that's just for starters. But we just read that word distress. They were so distressed. The Israelites were. And they didn't have to get there, folks. They didn't have to make it harder than it has to be. It's a challenge the way that it is. But it doesn't have to be that hard. You've heard us say it many times before. Whatever you're going through, you don't have to make it harder than it has to be. As long as you're completely surrendered over to, to the one true God of all creation. He is the creator who spoke the sun into existence. The universe into existence. He is the God who holds the little baby in his gentle arms too. That's the God that I serve. A man by the name of George Benson. You know that name. You know when Jerry and I were in high school, we started out to be jazz musicians. That was going to be our life, right? And we knew all of the artists at that time. George Benson was one of them. But he was a famous jazz, or is a, j a famous jazz artist, who was one of the best jazz guitarists in the world even to this day. Now I'm mentioning this for a reason, illustratively. Uh, his two most famous songs was an instrumental called Breezin, instrumental, but he also, second of all, had a song with lyrics called This Masquerade. Out of curiosity, I looked that up to see how this applies to life today. These are just a few of the words of that song. It's a sad song, really, very depressing. And it says, are we really happy here with this lonely game we play? Looking for words to say... Searching but not finding understanding anywhere. The lyrics continue. We're lost in a masquerade. Then it goes on to say we tried to talk it over but the words got in the way. We're lost inside of this lonely game we play. We're lost in a masquerade. I want to share with you four reasons why false apostles deceitful workmen and servants of Satan were able to deceive the church in New Testament times. And what I'm about to share with you, this is what happens and why people allow uh, masquerading raiders to take advantage even to this day. But one of the great possibilities is because Christians of that day were not taught about mas masquerading raiders. That's just one of the possibilities. They were not taught. Now let's go on to the second one. Christians of that day were taught, but did not listen to what was taught. They were taught, but they did not listen to what was taught. 
Thirdly, Christians of that day, in the same way in many circles today, they were taught but did not put the word into practice. And number four, Christians of that day were taught but they did not care to do anything about it. They were too busy wearing a mask or they couldn't see because of the mask being in the way or for any other reason, a number of them. With regard to the false apostles, deceitful workmen, and the servants of Satan, as exposed in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, they pretend to be the very apostles of Christ, according to 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, 13. They pretended to be good people with a Christian name, but they didn't live for God. That's how they could deceive. And that's the reason why the Bible says you got to know them by their fruit. you got to know their fruit. Amen? A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit, right? And a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. Uh, fruit. And so we got to know them. The Bible tells us this. Know them by their fruit. Not by what they say or others say, but by their fruit. Uh, so what I just shared from Scripture shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us as long as we're mature Christians. I want to be mature. This should not come as a surprise to us because we should already know that Satan's most destructive efforts are accomplished when he transforms himself into an angel of light. Heavy. Satan transforms himself into something that looks good but is nevertheless evil, wicked, and diabolical, destructive, and distressing. It's in this transformation that uh, there is a destructive, distressing masquerade. Take off the mask if you're there. That's why you're here, to read God's Word, to study God's Word. You know, it's a satanic cover-up is what it is to trick people into focusing on everyone and everything else but God. And we mentioned this last week, uh, that it's in the Bible where Paul the Apostle says, we never used trickery against you. We didn't do any tricking uh, against you. We, we minister to you with pure motives, the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus. How about if we just give God thanks and honor and glory? How about if we just send a, a smile of thank you, Jesus, to Him? <clears throat> if you've ever listened to the testimony of someone who was at one time, who was at one time a part of deceiving people spiritually, Here's what they have to say. Grace and I happened to hear somebody not too long ago who was testifying of what he had been delivered from. Satanic, occultism, witchcraft, and all of these things. Uh, transcendental meditation, soul travel. He, he was talking about these things. And, he's, and he said these words. Too many Christians make it easy for someone like I was to be deceived and distressed because they don't study the Word. He said they make it easy to be deceived because they don't pray. They make it easy for people like I was to be deceived because they're simply not committed to serving God. They have a little bit of religion. He said this, right? Am I, am I telling the right truth? He said they have a little bit of religion. They even go to church, but they are not serving God. And so that's the reason why Paul spoke what he spoke about. And so uh, he says they make it easy for raiders. People make it easy. Look, you and I, are we, are we here to, together? Don't make it easy for the devil to gain access into your house or your marriage or your children. Don't make it easy. Make it hard. Amen. In fact, for that matter, make it hard for people to go to hell by your con constant love and encourage, encouraging them through the word. Make it hard for them to go to hell. Because there's some people that are determined to go to hell until they receive a revelation of truth. Praise him for that too. Amen. But basically, those who had been delivering from such a life, he said, Christians make it easy for these raiders because they're too busy looking at everyone else but not looking to God. They're too busy looking to everyone else for advice but not looking to God for, ad for counsel and advice and direction. They're lost inside of this lonely game they play. They're lost in a masquerade. Hey, if this is the last message we hear, the last message I preach, may it count. May it make a, a, a dent against the forces of darkness. And even that, may we be able to destroy the forces of darkness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, <coughs> Scripture is clear to let us know that masquerading masqueraders, including false apostles, deceitful workmen, and servants of Satan, who follow Satan's lead, they will face the same just judgment that Satan will face, namely that of eternal and everlasting destruction. They're going to face that. And he closed by saying that. As a young, ignorant, arrogant, unsaved teenager, 
I know you can't believe that I was there, but I was. I got some friends who went to school with me, and they can testify. In fact, come on, guys, come here. No, I'm just kidding. But as a young, ignorant, sinful young man, now, in many ways, I was a gentleman, and these guys know I tried to be, but that doesn't mean that uh, I wasn't kind at times. But as a young teenager, if some of the boys ever wanted to be mean to the girls, we would tell them, Halloween is over, why don't you take off the mask? We used to tell them that, to be mean. You know, when I got saved, I said, Lord, forgive me for being mean at those times. When I did eventually grow up and get saved, I asked God to forgive me, but there was something more than that. Although that phrase was a downright put down to someone, there is a certain spiritual truth to that in that a mask is a symbol, like we started talking about last week. It's a symbol of several things, including uh, what the Bible says, according to Scripture. We already know that it symbolizes blindness, hypocrisy, rebellion, and indecisiveness. Oh, but we don't stop there. There's more. Out of 365 days a year, many people choose one day to put on their masks. But I'm convinced, and you and I are convinced, that those who are spiritually deceived put their masks on for 364 days out of the year, and then they take it off on October the 31st of each year. It's a very, very real thing. Since we made reference to certain movies or shows to illustrate what a mask is, there is one movie or a series of movies, and actually it was a TV series also that the movies were made of uh, later of, from the 1970s. Oh, and now you know how old I am, from the 1970s. And it was the Mission Impossible movie series as well as the TV series from the They were the very best at creating masks. How many remember that? They were the best at creating masks, whether it was the masks of the bad guys to deceive the bad guys, or the masks of good guys for one reason or another. And then you would really believe that this was the person who had been throughout the movie, right? And then there came a time when they what? What did they do, hon? Huh? They went like this, and then they started to peel that mask off their face, and we said, oh, wow. They were the best at creating masks. But I think that it's not just Hollywood who creates masks. You and I, when we're careless, we can create a mask, and I want you to be careful about this. Amen. Um, and by the way, the mask also represents a happy face when you're sad on the inside. If you're sad on the inside or confused or oppressed, you got to let somebody know. Take off that mask and ask for somebody to help you pray with you or whatever it is. Because there's an awful lot of people, you know this, don't you, that are hurting on the inside. How you doing? Oh, I'm great. Everything's good. And some way, somehow, if you're in tune with what God is wanting to do, you know that they're not happy. They're sad. You don't have to live a sad life. You can live a happy, contented, fulfilled life, even in the midst of trials and tribulation. Praise the Lord for that, too. Amen. <laughs> May I go a little bit further? We talked last week about the different types of masks and what they represent. A mask is a type of blindness. It's a type of hypocr hypocrisy. It's a type of rebellion, and it's a type of indecisiveness. But there's one more that we didn't get to finish with, if you will permit me. Uh, number five, a mask is a type of your old self. Now, that doesn't mean that you were a different person. Spiritually, you were. That doesn't mean that you had a different name or identity. It just means that your old self doesn't make it anymore. You need a new person in your life, and that's Jesus Christ, right? So a mask is a type of your old self. To take off the mask is to take off the old self and to put on the new self. Again, to take off the mask, I got to find out if you're with me still in this. It's really quiet. To take off the mask is to take off the old self and to put on the new self. So I'm going to direct your attention into the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Let's read beginning with verse 17. He said, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Verse 19, having lost all sensitivity because of the mask, right? Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Like an addiction. And if you're going through an addiction, there's a miracle in store for you. But you got to reach out to the reaching out hands. There's a miracle in store for you. God is a miracle worker. 
Verse 20. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Somebody say to put off your old self. Somebody say my old self. To put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. He emphasized it even further. And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. One of the definitions for the word mask or masquerade is falsehood. Uh, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So here's the message as I begin to wind this down. Halloween is over. Take off the mask and put on the new self. You've been redeemed. So live in that new self of who God wants you to be. When you were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, your old self was done away with, and you were able to put on the new man, which is Christ Jesus living in you. And there's nothing better than that. Amen. When I get to a point where I'm going to, I feel like I may easily feel down and out. i got to remember Jesus Christ who suffered for me. Nobody suffered like Him. And therefore I am encouraged by that. The Bible describes the spiritual condition of this world system as being in darkness. Even when things look fun, cute, and innocent. Isaiah chapter 5 tells us that there will be, this is a sign of the times, when many things will look cute and innocent like child's play, but is nevertheless deceiving. So Peter, the apostle, said in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, he said, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The hand of the Lord is calling us. He's calling us to draw closer to him and look only to him. That was a good word that we heard earlier today. Keep your eyes on the cross because it's a reminder of what Jesus has done for us. He is no longer on the cross. So you see, he rose from the dead. He was dead. He died. He was beaten and bruised, but he rose from the dead, and now he's glorified, and we too will one day be glorified. He said that the only scars, he teaches us that the only scars in heaven will not be ours, but his, because they were, they were made by the hands of men, which demonstrated love and kindness and mercy and salvation for us. I love like that, that song about scars. The only scars in heaven will not be yours, but they will belong to the one who holds you in his arms. And I'm not one to remember lyrics, but that I do remember. Listen, if you've got a mask of oppression, take it off. Find somebody to pray with you. That's accountability. Find somebody that you can trust. Know them by their fruit. Okay? And that's all that God is asking us to do. And so today, we spoke about exposing the masked raiders of the New Testament that the Bible tells us to expose through the Word of God. Shall we pray? Bow your heads right there where you're seated. Many of you have tuned in online to listen to this. We're so grateful for your prayers. We always thank God for that. Some of you who are listening and watching even at this time, you need help, but you gotta, you got to let others know. It's not a pretending thing, okay? He's ready to wrap you in his arms and to say, it's going to be all right. Let's walk together. Let's walk. Would you say this after me if you're ready for a new way of living? Father in heaven, in your name only, the only name, the name of Jesus, I surrender to you. I have sinned against you. And I am so sorry. Please forgive me. Have mercy on me. Because I need you. Save me. And by trusting in you, who died on the cross for me, by the shedding of your blood, Lord, and through your resurrection, I'm asking you personally, live in me as my personal Savior, save me. I receive by faith salvation from you. One pair of hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead then. Mm -hmm. One pair of hands. 
The same one who created the sun and the moon and the stars is the same one who holds you into his arms. If you live in the Pueblo area or if you're visiting in this area from out of town, we'd love for you to join us for a time of worship at Abundant Life Church, located at 1001 Constitution Road in the Belmont area of Pueblo. The time of our services are 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings and 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. We at Abundant Life Church believe you'll find a loving group of people here and an exciting atmosphere of fellowship, hope, and encouragement. We look forward to seeing you. is greater than the greatest love that you or I could understand. It's sweeter than sugar, it's softer than a fine wood. Yes, the love of Jesus is worth more to me than life. And I sing, canto hallelujah, canto gloria a Dios. Señor Jesucristo, tú vives en mi corazón. Canto hallelujah, canto gloria a Dios. Señor Jesucristo. 